Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Colin Kaepernick is an awfully brave man, maybe the bravest since Audie Murphy. Our betters are telling us that. That's why he's being celebrated by those in power and paid millions of dollars by a massive corporation. We'll discuss his new Nike deal just ahead. It's all part of the revolution in progress. Plus, we'll tell you a lot more about NBC News chairman Andy Lack and the maneuverings of that channel to protect sexual predator Harvey Weinstein. We have brand new reporting on that, which is fascinating and unnerving. But first, as you know, Capitol Hill was in chaos today thanks to the first day of hearings for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Just a few days ago, you may remember, that was history, but see if you can recall talking heads telling you that John McCain's funeral, if it meant anything, meant that unity and civility had to return to Washington. All of these people who are warring on normal days coming together, it it was really dramatic. But this notion of unity is really what I've been seeing. Speakers at the service also spoke of bipartisanship and putting country over party. Country over party. Well, that didn't happen today. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley of Iowa couldn't even get the hearing started without being interrupted repeatedly by his Democratic colleagues. Here's a selection. I welcome everyone to this confirmation hearing on the nomination of Mr. Judge Chairman Brett Kavanaugh. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be recognized to ask a question before we proceed. Mr. Chairman, Judge we Kavanaugh's received 42,000 documents that we haven't and been everyone able else joining to review us last today. night, and we believe this hearing should I know be postponed. This is an we have been denied real access to the documents we need to advise. Mr. Chairman, the regular Senate, orders called for. Which turns this hearing into a charade and a mockery of our norms. Well, and Mr. Chairman, I therefore move to adjourn this hearing. It's the war hero from Connecticut. By the way, we didn't edit that tape. That was literally the very beginning, and Senator Harris of California immediately interrupted him. Meanwhile, the multiple screaming lefty protesters didn't get the memo about bipartisanship either. Here's what they did. So it wasn't a good day for bipartisanship. Brett Hume has seen a lot of confirmation hearings, so he's got some perspective to draw from. That's why he's our senior political analyst here at Fox, and he joins us tonight on the set. Britt, what was this? I mean, substantively different from other confirmation hearings, would you say? Well, it was much more of a circus than they have been in the past, although some of these confirmation hearings have gotten pretty brutal and pretty political. Yes. But I think what you saw today in this, in this, this whole uproar uh, was a reflective of a couple of things. Part of it is pure partisanship. Part of it is resistance to Trump and the desire of some Democrats on the committee to show that they are part of that resistance. But beyond that, there's something deeper and more sincerely felt, and that is a a genuine fear that the addition of uh, Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court to succeed Anthony Kennedy means that the court will tip to a judicial philosophy more to the right. The left has been much more dependent over the decades uh, on the course to achieve policy goals it could not achieve through legislation. It couldn't pass through legislatures, uh, couldn't get signed by presidents, and so on. And that's how we came to have a, 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 a universal right to an abortion. That was something that was created by the courts. So voters didn't do that. No, voters did not do that. And, the, and, I, don't think, and, and I don't think at the time it was done, voters would have done so. The same is true for the recognition of gay marriage now as a right. Uh, that, was, uh, that emanated, if it did at all, from Justice Kennedy's view that there was a kind of a, a dignity vibe that he discovered in the Constitution. I've probably been lurking there for hundreds of years unnoticed that gave rise to a right uh, to gay marriage. Now, I'm not saying these, are, these policy results are good or bad. What I'm saying is this, they were achieved through the courts and not through legislatures, not through the normal political processes. Democrats have been much more dependent on the courts than Republicans have. Republicans have resisted these things, being conservatives and so on. And the tipping of the balance of the court to the right, I think, th- threatens what Democrats feel has been one of their key uh, agencies, really, for, for their agenda. And that's why you have this resistance. It's partly politics. I understand. I understand that, and and they're mad about Merrick Garland, and honestly, I think they have right to be mad about Merrick Garland. Actually, I'm probably the only person who thinks that, but I do think that. 
What I'm so struck by, though, is that they're not making substantive arguments about his ideas or his fitness for the court. I mean, that would be fair game, I think. Well, when you do hear the substantive arguments, they tend to go like this. There'll be a list presented of the parties that have prevailed in cases on which he has ruled. And from that is it extrapolated that he either favors this kind of a party or that kind of a party, this, right. this kind of plaintiff or this kind of defendant. I understand. Now, these, these, these arguments that are made to, about conservative jurists based on that kind of reasoning leave aside entirely what the law may have commanded in those cases. In other words, okay, so the corporations won in, in cases, you know, one through ten, yes. therefore you're pro-corporation. Well, what about what the law said? Maybe the corporations won because that's what the law requires. Exactly. And that kind of analysis is, is frequently missing, as it was indeed today, among the uh, few arguments made by members of the, uh, of very the Senate point. Who, and I who, who were talking about at least the substance of his record to some extent. So this does seem like kind of pure power politics. He'll get through if enough partisans can be rallied to their own side to get him through. Now, this is going to be a, a, a party-line vote. I don't think there's much question about okay, so, that. But, but, the but question will the, he get through? Republicans keep every senator? Well, so far, no, it doesn't appear that the Democrats have been successful in peeling off any Republican votes. But make no mistake about it, Tucker. I covered the Bork hearings in 1987, and yes. we were well into the hearings when I was standing in the hallway talking to then-chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Joe Biden, and he told me that Bork was going to, Bork was going to be confirmed. And within a matter of days, the tide turned, and it turned during the hearings because, because the nominee did not make very smart political answers right. to questions he was asked about his views on privacy. I won't go into all the details of it, but the point was um, he answered legally questions that he needed to answer and, and, and more politically, and if he had, he would not successfully have been tarred with the idea that he was anti-privacy, which was, which was right. what it turned on. The predicate for Roe v. Right. Wade. Yeah, I think every nominee since has learned not to make the mistake of saying what you think is true. One reason why I think Democrats have to be worried this time that they can't turn this around is that Republicans and conservatives have learned a lot of since course. 1987 about Same how to present these nominees, what sort of nominees to name, how to prepare them, and how to prepare the ground. Well, you know, there's been this big ad campaign uh, backing Kavanaugh on national television yes. ads I've seen. Uh, that's all relatively new. We haven't seen that before. So his chances look very good. But believe me, Tucker, anything can happen. That's why we're covering it. Britt Hume, thank you for that, yeah. as always. Great to thank see you. you. Julian Epstein is former chief counsel to the Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee, right? And the sweet spot of this story, and he joins us tonight. So, um, Julian, I, I, I want to put on the screen a tweet that went out today, because so much political debate does take place on social media. This was one of the trending tweets on Twitter. It's from a woman called Amy Siskin, and it says this. Has, what the hell is that? Kavanaugh's assistant, Zena Bash, giving the white power sign right behind him during this hearing. This alone should disqualify. Now, the woman behind him, the assistant, Zena Bash, um, the white supremacist, is in fact not white. She's Hispanic and she's also Jewish. That's lunatic. And yet it trended. It got 15,000 likes almost immediately. What does that tell you about the state of the left right now? Well, it, it tells me that our politics is broken. I mean, I think, I think you see examples of this kind of lunacy on the left and on the right. And I think it's got no place in our politics, and I think it's an inevitable result of kind of uh, the social media uh, uh, echo chamber that drives so much of politics yeah. today. And it's very, very unfortunate. You know, I agree with a lot of what, what, what Britt said, I think, and, and what you said. I think a lot of what you saw at the hearing, first of all, I, don't, I didn't think the histrionics were helpful. I didn't think the shouters in the crowd. To the Democratic side. I don't think it was helpful to Democrats, and I didn't think the repeated interruptions by Democratic senators were particularly helpful to the case that they're trying to make. I do think it reflects an anger that they have over Merrick Garland. He had eight right. months before the election. I get it. Couldn't get a hearing. This is two months before the election. I think it's a, an expression of that anger. I do think that this is, entire hearing process has become completely broken. And I think it's just kind of winking performance art at this point. I, I don't think we get anything out of these hearings. I think um, it's time for the Democrats and Republicans in the spirit that you were alluding to at the outset, the John McCain spirit, to come together and kind of fix this process. There should be an agreement between Democrats and Republicans for all future nominees is on this document question about what documents the committee gets, what are subject to executive privilege. That shouldn't be something you're fighting out on a case-by-case -case basis. That should be settled. I think this idea that justice has come up and they don't really testify about what they think, what they really believe in, what do they think Roe was rightly decided yes. or wrongly decided, 
it. I think that's all nonsense. I think that's silly. I think the whole argument that that would prejudice them in a future case, I think that somebody came up I, with that I at some point. I agree with you I think it's completely fine. That's lying. It forces all of these guys, no matter how honest they are, no matter how committed to integrity they are, to lie about what they think or to fudge or to basically put on an ad campaign on their own behalf, which is unseemly. Or, or to make it a completely empty vacuum. Exactly. Theory. And there's no, nothing I, There's nothing in the Constitution. There's really, there's nothing really in, in, I think, in serious judicial thinking that says that a Supreme Court nominee can't say if he thought a previous case was rightly decided or wrongly decided or how they might uh, approach that case. And, and they can, at the same time, speak about the value and the role of press. I agree. I mean, why why should I hire you to make decisions if you won't tell me what you think? So I think the Democrats are playing a different game as well. well okay, I mean, so I, but maybe my, my guess, and I can't believe we're agreeing so much, but I'm uh, open-minded. Uh, no, agree. it's true. But my sense about the opening drama, the screaming, the interrupting, which I hated, was the Democrats know that he's going to get through, barring some unforeseen development, and For they sure. want to reassure their voters that they're not for and they're doing all they can. Well, I, I think they've got to show the base. I think they've got to show some energy uh, to the base, and I think that's why I say it's kind of winking performance art. Um, I think that they know that it's not going to ha it's not going to change votes in the Judiciary Committee or on the floor. He's an extraordinarily well qualified candidate. I disagree with a lot of the things right. that he's, he's he said and done in his rulings. He's extraordinarily well qualified, and he'll get the votes. He'll be confirmed. But I think Democrats are playing a different game, and, and I think they're playing it to the base. I mean, I think what they're do trying to do is make the nomination as much as possible about Trump. Right. They sense they have an 11 to 14 point lead right now in the generics, depending whether you pay attention to the USA Today poll or the ABC poll. And I think that they think that the debates on health care, pre-existing conditions, which Kavanaugh does not seem to be a fan of, with that case coming up to the court. I think uh, the question of reproductive freedom or choice. Uh, I think they think these are all good debates. They think most people agree with reproductive freedom or choice. Most people like pre-existing conditions. Most people don't like what Kavanaugh said about if, assault if, weapons If you and guns. call reproductive freedom what it is, which is abortion, do the public abortion. members change? Uh, yeah. yeah. they do change. They, they, yeah. Yes, well, they do. so they do, but majorities, uh, the numbers are still, I mean, if you look at where Kavanaugh's uh -huh. numbers are, the numbers that want to see him approved are in the upper 30s right now. And part of it is because he's become, this has kind of become a proxy debate on a lot of issues, including, well, as, in, including abortion. As always. I, I think in our political system, we are just spending way, way, way too much time on the culture wars right but now. But wouldn't it be more helpful and edifying for all of us? And by edifying, I mean, the rest of us could help, would make up our minds more thoughtfully if we could have a real debate about this stuff instead of this bizarre kabuki where everyone's speaking in code. Yeah. I mean, if he's against abortion, tell us why. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I am. I can tell you why. Maybe I can win you over. There's nothing wrong with that. And you know what? And, and I respect that. I respect people who are anti-abortion. I respect their point of view. I don't agree with it. Right. But I respect it. And I think it's honestly held. And I think it's a, it, it, it's a respectable and, and honorable a position for someone to hold, and it, it, it's deeply connected to oftentimes to religious beliefs and other and other sets of beliefs. And I and I think we should be able to have a respectful position, a respectful debate on that. I think the idea in a Supreme Court nomination that the kind of the next Supreme Court justice is hiding behind this kind of phony. And, and liberals and progressive and, and conservatives do it. I mean, Democratic I nominees and Republicans do it. They hide behind this phony, we can't get into the details of it because it may prejudice a future case. It's nonsense. I, I couldn't agree more. Boy, that was that was an awful lot of agreement for one segment. Let's but find something to disagree amen. about. <laughs> Julian Epstein, thank you very much for that conversation. Thanks. NBC News had ample evidence of exactly what Harvey Weinstein was doing to women. They killed the story anyway, and then they lied about it. The real question is, why did they do that? Maybe there was a reason we should know about. We've investigated that question, and we'll tell you what we found up next. Sure. NBC News actively covered up Harvey Weinstein's abuse of women. That was clear months ago when the story first broke, and we told you about it then. It's even clearer now. The remarkable thing is that NBC is still lying about it, but more elaborately. In a long memo released last night, NBC News chairman Andy Lack spent 11 pages claiming that his network couldn't air Ronan Farrow's investigation of Weinstein, the same piece that later ran in The New Yorker and won a Pulitzer Prize. There just wasn't enough evidence, Lack said. There weren't any on-the-record allegations against Harvey Weinstein. 
Well, that is false, and now we can prove it is. On our NBC show this morning, Megyn Kelly bravely pointed out, because she still works there, that there was, in fact, an on-the-record source against Harvey Weinstein. It was Rose McGowan. And NBC knew this because McGowan's claim was included in a script that made it to the very top of the company, and that included the general counsel of the company. We spoke to a source by phone who read us the pertinent line from that script. Here it is. Quote, in later conversations with NBC News, she, Rose McGowan, specifically named Weinstein. Well, there you have it. That's the story right there. Done cold. Of course, NBC also had videotape shot by police in New York of Harvey Weinstein himself confessing to abuse on camera. So they had the whole thing nailed. And they suppressed it. And it protected Weinstein. Now they're lying about it. We probably shouldn't be surprised by any of these, this. NBC News also lied about the infamous Access Hollywood tape, which they leaked to the Washington Post on the eve of a presidential debate in order to influence the outcome of that debate and the election. And then to compound the crime, they fired and humiliated their own anchor, Billy Bush, for the crime of, well, actually, we're not sure what the crime was. But we do know that NBC lied to its viewers and to the rest of us throughout that whole episode. We have asked NBC repeatedly to account for it. How did a secretly recorded videotape that was their property get from their offices to the hands of NBC News Chief Noah Oppenheim's college buddy, David Fahrenholt, at the Washington Post? We ask that question because transparency is at the heart of every legitimate news organization, but not at the heart of NBC. They won't answer our question. That's not surprising. What is surprising, if you think about it for a minute, is why NBC didn't run the Weinstein story in the first place. They knew it was factually true. It was news. It was a story. It met the definition. But they also, more critically, knew that Ronan Farrow might hurt them if they killed the story. And, of course, in the end, he did hurt them badly. They knew that might happen, but they killed it anyway. Why did they do that? We decided to investigate this question, and we did. We spoke to a number of people with direct knowledge of this story. And here's what we got. Harvey Weinstein had a long and documented history of using private investigators to unearth damaging information about people who threatened him. He did that repeatedly to many people. He did it to the New York Times, for example. Did he do that to the leadership of NBC? People close to the story believe that he did. Some within the company believe that Weinstein threatened to reveal damaging information about NBC's then biggest star, Matt Lauer. So we asked NBC about this today. We asked directly. They answered a number of our questions, but notably, they ignored our question about Matt Lauer completely. That's interesting. Here's another question. How many people within the hierarchy of NBC knew about all of this? One obvious person to ask is Chuck Todd. He's the network's political director. He's the host of Meet the Press. Todd is a famously connected guy. Information is his currency. How could he not know what was happening inside his own company? NBC gets the biggest scoop of the year and then kills it mysteriously. Of course Chuck Todd knew. What does he think of that? Is squelching first-person accounts of sexual assault by powerful men consistent with Chuck Todd's view of journalism? Is it ethical? Did Chuck Todd ever complain about this inside the building at NBC? Why didn't he quit over it? Or is it better just to shut up and pretend that sexual assault didn't happen in the hopes of keeping the highest paying job he'll ever have? Maybe that's the answer. We don't know for sure because Chuck Todd didn't respond to our questions when we reached out today. But we'll call again. Soon we'll have occasion to call because the Daily Beast is preparing what sounds like a blockbuster investigation into serious and widespread personal misconduct, both at MSNBC and at NBC News. It sounds shocking. And from what we can tell, it sounds true. We'll check back with Chuck Todd when it comes out, and we'll see what he has to say. Meantime, Larry O'Connor is associate editor of The Washington Times, and he joins us tonight. So, Larry, NBC has changed its story just within the last 24 hours. Initially, Andy Lack said we had no on-the-record evidence or claim of any alleged victim of Harvey Weinstein. That's why we didn't run the story. Right. Couldn't run now, it because they wouldn't go on the record. Exactly. Now, the script has come to light from last summer in which Rose McGowan is quoted saying... On the record, yep. he abused me. Now Lack is saying we had no on-camera, on the on the record accusation. A, shouldn't he admit he lied? And B, you don't need an on-camera 
well, account to run it. Do of you? course, I, especially when you've got Harvey Weinstein on video from the New York Police Department basically apologizing for the sexual assault against the one victim that sort of blew the story apart. Also, can we pause for a moment and talk about the irony of NBC News saying they won't run a story if someone won't go on the record? How many anonymous sourced stories have they run over the last year, two years about the Trump administration? None of those anonymous sources go on the record. So why is it different here? And and why would it have Such to be a good point? A, a, and a sexual assault victim. Think about that for a minute. You know, the, 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 it takes a lot of courage for these women to step forward and speak with Ronan Farrow. And Ronan should get tons of credit. He already has, and it's all deserved. But think about the courage that these victims had to show to come forth, tell their stories, and point the finger to the most powerful man in Hollywood. And NBC News is aiding and abetting that man they by saying, you've got to show us your face. You've got to give us your name. That, that's outrageous what they did to these women. Look, we're all flawed, and all news organizations are flawed. But covering up for Harvey Weinstein is really at, at a different level. I know a lot of people at NBC, and I like a lot of them. There are some decent people there, for sure. But you got to wonder how some of these people can work there without having addressed it. Chuck Todd, for example. How can Chuck Todd host Meet the Press without at least issuing a statement saying, I agree with Andy Lack's lies or I distance myself from his lies? I mean, how can we believe what he says if he's standing by this nonsense? Well, of course, Andy Lack is his boss, right? And by right? the way, let's not forget uh, Mr. Oppenheim. No, Oppenheim is the president of NBC News. His name is on these memos, too, and he's all in on the exact same story that we didn't have anybody to go on the record. They also said it He's wasn't running around, by the way, running around. A lot of these executives are running around NBC tonight, I know for a fact, telling its employees to shut up. Yeah. And that itself, I mean, I don't want to use the term cover up, but is that the behavior of a transparent integrity-filled news organization? Of no, it's not. not. No, it's not. And the behavior I, of the mafia. You mentioned Megyn Kelly showing some courage this morning coming out and saying, listen, we've got three, four people now on this side of the equation, Ronan Farrow, his producer, Rose McGowan, and one other woman who was named in this story, saying, this is what happened. We were ready. We had it. Ronan Farrow has said that the story even what made it all the way up to the general counsel of the network. And Andy Lack, Noah Oppenheim, and all the executives are saying no. Megyn Kelly saying, hey, someone's lying here. She wants an independent investigation. How about that irony? Should we get a special counsel Boy, does that to take, investigate that the NBC takes an awful lot of guts, and I hope that she gets the credit for the guts. Yeah. I mean, that's what journalism is. When you stand up and say the unpopular but true thing, do you think that's being rewarded at NBC? Not at all. What's being rewarded is Chuck Todd. You know, Chuck, you mentioned Chuck Todd. He spent the last several days talking a lot about journalism, talking a lot about how the media is the most unpopular entity in this country right now. And he's blaming everybody except, you know, clean up your own house. Look at what's going on in your building. Right so in now, other words, Chuck your Todd. company covers up for an accused sex criminal and you never address it. But you're empowered to lecture everyone else about their shortcomings. That appears to be what Mr. Todd has been. So, but why wouldn't it be fair for days. viewers of NBC to say, Chuck Todd, look, we're not accusing you of hurting anybody or being Harvey Weinstein. We're accusing you of abetting a cover up working for a company that obviously participated in a cover-up for Harvey Weinstein. Why don't you address it? Yeah. Yeah. You would think that they should be asking those tough questions of Mr. Todd, but I haven't seen it quite yet. Well, we're of, asking them now. So we are. Chuck. A lot of cowards in journalism. Larry, you're not among them. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Colin Kaepernick is brave, and he spoke truth to power. Maybe the bravest person in the history of this country. That's what powerful corporations are telling you, corporations that are making more money than you could count in a lifetime, and yet claim they're part of the revolution. <laughs> it raises a lot of questions, like why is corporate America celebrating attacks on the country that made it possible? because they're decadent, that's why. We've got details next. Global mega corporation Nike, which is cooler and more virtuous than you, has made Colin Kaepernick the star of its latest major ad campaign. That's because what real bravery looks like is getting celebrated by almost everyone in power and getting huge money from an enormously, enormously wealthy and influential company. Many regular Americans aren't as impressed, though. Some have already posted videos of themselves burning Nike gear. But before you throw your support to another mega corporation who hates your way of life, consider this. According to reports, Puma and Adidas also pursued Kaepernick before he signed with Nike. So something much larger is afoot. What is it exactly? Jason Whitlock hosts Speak for Yourself on FS1, and he joins us tonight. So, Jason, I read this story. My first thought was of you. I'm going to withhold any more judgment and allow you to lay out what this means. I think that Nike 
has issues, PR issues. They've been sued for discrimination by both black people and women. They fired a bunch of executives recently. And long before any of that, Nike's had a problem with slave labor, uh, slave labor in Asia. And the people that actually make their shoes, uh, Nike has no problem with their oppression. And so I, I think that Colin Kaepernick aligning with him is a marketing PR ploy by uh, Nike to cover up their larger, bigger problems and to, to feed the left-wing media. So, oh, look, we're friends of Kaepernick. So overlook these years of criticism about the slave labor that makes our shoes and the exploitation that we're perfectly fine with. And then, Sucker, I'll go even a step further. When you look at uh, President Trump's Make America First policies and how they're impacting comp corporations like a Nike and the, the business they do overseas, go have their uh, materials made in another country for less money and then bring them back into our country without being taxed or punished for that, I, I just think Nike is playing politics here on a number of different levels. And it's a PR stunt that I think is going to blow up and backfire in their face. No different. This reminds me of ESPN uh, naming Caitlyn Jenner the most courageous person in America uh, because she, she had a sex change operation. Uh, I, I think this is cut from that same cloth and how that, doing that, a labeled ESPN is PC and out of touch with middle America I think this play here with Colin Kaepernick is going to backfire on Nike. So what you're saying, I mean, you're describing something a little more sophisticated than just a kind of reflexive kowtowing to PC sensibility. What you're saying is this is a company that could be attacked on legitimate grounds by critics and on the left for exploiting workers, for being bad for the world, but to avoid being attacked, they pay a kind of indulgence, a tax to the church of PC by making Colin Kaepernick even richer, and they don't get criticized. Is that what you're saying? Without question. And I think this was really a harebrained idea and scheme. It's a sign of desperation. I, I, again, I think it's going to blow up in their face. This is just bad business. And, and, and I, I get it. For a business to move into something this polarizing with yes. sports fans, it's just crazy to me when Nike has made so much money and became this powerful force uh, going with Michael Jordan, who avoided right. politics and understood yeah. that everybody at the end of the day buys shoes. I, you know, the hypocrisy here by Nike is extreme. Uh, you know, using Colin Kaepernick in this way, and I don't blame Colin Kaepernick. He's going to take a check from wherever he can get it. This is Nike using him to cover up for their own internal and external problem. But do you think any, I mean, that's such a smart point. As a business decision, why would you, if you were Nike, especially a company with historically universal appeal, want to narrow your potential customer base to 40% of the country or narrow it at all? Why would you do that? That seems pretty short-sighted. Because there are executives running all over America who basically grew up in the countercultural era of the 60s and 70s, and now they're in positions of power, and they're doing crazy harebrained things with their companies. Again, I I've said it a million times, uh, ESPN eventually thought that doing PC politics was good business, and it's just not. They're playing Nike and a lot of corporations are playing to Twitter way too often. Yeah. They think if we can just make Twitter happy and make the left-wing dominated Twitter happy, we're going to make the world a better place and we're going to make our business better. It's just not going to happen. It's so, it's so smart. It's a theme that you hit it again, again and again, and I'm glad that you do. Social media is changing our world, our society, our brains even in ways that we don't even perceive. Thank you for reminding us of that. Jason Whitlock, as always. Thank you, Doug. Well, Washington, D.C.'s send-off for Senator John McCain revealed more about the nation's capital than it did about Senator McCain, and very little of that was good. We'll have a recap for you on the late senator's memorial service after the break.
couple of notes about John McCain's funeral this past week. Almost everyone who spoke described McCain as a hero, and in that they were absolutely right. I spent the better part of a year with McCain once, starting in the summer of 1999, and can confirm that he was every bit as tough as people say he was. I was sitting two rows back from him on a charter flight when our plane was hit by lightning and a thunderstorm. For a minute, we seemed to be falling out of the sky. People on board screamed in panic. McCain and I watched this, yawned, and went back to sleep. Months later, I walked through Wallow Prison with him in Hanoi, where he had spent years in solitary confinement, being tortured with ropes. That was the happiest time of my life, he said, almost under his breath. It was clear that he meant it. There aren't a lot of people like John McCain in this country anymore, and that's a shame. There was a lot about him to admire. You've got to wonder what he would have made of his funeral and its coverage on television. The parade of greasy politicians and mindless cliché merchants using his death to celebrate themselves. If you've ever lost someone you care about, ask yourself, what would it take for you to launch into a political speech in the middle of a eulogy? Would you even consider doing that? Everyone mourns in different ways, of course, but at McCain's funeral, everyone seemed to be mourning in exactly the same way and demanding the rest of us do it that way, too. Just a few election cycles ago, many of these very same people were denouncing John McCain as a racist and a danger to this country. Some of them were attacking his wife and children. Now they're using John McCain's memory to attack the rest of us, anyone who's not with their program, a program that has made them richer and more self-satisfied than any ruling class in history, even as our country's middle class has withered and died. Technically, it was a bipartisan group that mourned McCain. They said that a lot. But on the questions that matter, they were in complete agreement with each other. The status quo is working for them. Anyone who challenges it must be crushed. The media applauded the whole thing, of course. They're on the same team as the people on the stage with the same prerogatives at stake. They led the cheerleading. They nodded in solemn, bovine agreement as one member of Congress even described John McCain as, quote, a warrior for peace. The smarter ones in the media must have been snickering secretly at the absurdity of that. A warrior for peace? It's ridiculous. And it's not an attack on John McCain to say so. McCain was a warrior for war. He said so himself many times. He was not ashamed of that, hardly. John McCain's life was forged in war. He was probably the most warlike senator Washington ever produced, and he was proud of that. But when they start describing him as Gandhi, you know they're not just lying, they are telling you the opposite of the truth. But that's their signature move, inverting reality and demanding that you believe it. Low-wage immigration makes us rich. Debt makes us secure. Men and women are identical. Abortion is freedom. Diversity is strength. War is peace. They say these things with great vehemence, not because they believe them, but precisely because they know they're not true. They are lies so obvious they can only be disseminated by force, but not for long. Lies do not endure forever. People find out in the end. There was a wistfulness at the funeral that suggested a lot of these people were mourning not just John McCain's passing, but the coming end of their own reign and the fantasies that made it possible. Or maybe they're not that self-aware. Either way, I wish I'd been able to include that scene in my new book. The book is about this very group of people and the damage they have caused to our country. It's called Ship of Fools, How a Selfish Ruling Class is Bringing America to the Brink of Revolution. It's out in a few weeks, but you can order it now. It's a middle finger aimed right back in their direction. Hope you like it. American institutions used to celebrate effort and ability and fairness. Now all of those values are being sacrificed to the god of diversity, which is our only strength, we are told. But is it? And what does this mean for our country going forward? Next, we're going to speak with someone who just wrote a book on the subject. Smart, interesting. Stay tuned. Universities were once havens for free speech and free thinking. That's why they exist, to be that. But increasingly, they're not that at all. They are safe spaces for people who don't want to explore uncomfortable ideas. Can academia and this country become open-minded again? Heather McDonald's been thinking a lot about it. She's wrote a book on this topic. It's titled The Diversity Delusion, How We're Creating a Nation of Narrowed Minds. And she joins us tonight. Heather McDonald, it's always great to have you on the show. Thank you. So, it's an honor. 
I think we've established, and our viewers, uh, I think, are on board with the reality of it, which is that free thinking is banned in colleges. So how, what do you do about it now? How do you fix that? Well, I think you have to address the root cause of this free speech crisis, Tucker. The free speech crisis is bad enough, but it is a result of something that is even more poisonous, which is the spreading of victim ideology. College presidents are telling their own students that they are at risk of lethal racism and sexism simply by, being, uh, by virtue of being on a college campus. That is an outright lie. There is no more tolerant place, if you're not a conservative, than a college campus today. Yes. There is no more privileged position than being a student with immediate access to the thing that Faust sold his soul for, which is knowledge. So we need to take on this poisonous narrative that college campuses in America in general are roiling masses of discrimination and sexism. You're doing that. You're doing more than your part just by saying what's evidently true. I mean, I think you get a lot out of just calling BS on ideas that are obviously stupid and wrong. But why don't more people in authority do that? Why are people so cowed by the institutional left? Well, there is no more dangerous epithet you can hurl around these days than racist, and people simply crumple. Uh, but the faculty have to stand up. They have to both defend free speech, but as I say, even more importantly, they have to defend the Western civilization that is their extraordinary privilege to pass on to the next generation of students. And if they are not willing to do that, if they're willing to capitulate to these preposterous charges that to read Homer or to read Aeschylus or to read Shakespeare is to be subject to life-threatening racism, they should simply resign uh, because they are betraying the amazing legacy that is their privilege to pass on. Yeah. Our, our, our leaders are bent on destroying the institutions that made all of this possible. Very quickly, do you think that can happen? I mean, is there any hope that you can redeem academia in our intellectual life in this country? Or do we need to build something new? Well, it would be great to build new colleges. Unfortunately, they're going to face a prestige gap. Right. Uh, parents that purport to be anti-materialistic, anti-capitalist, are frenzied to credentialize their student with the most prestigious <laughs> college diploma they can get. Uh, ideally, they'd go for knowledge rather than simply the credentials. But I think we still have to keep on fighting within the university to shame uh, these cowards, to shame the college presidents. And certainly, alumni have to stop giving money. Parents have to do due diligence. The trustees have to strap on some balls and actually exercise their fiduciary responsibilities to make sure that these colleges are actually educating students in our extraordinary civilization with its conquest of disease, of poverty, of want, and the ability to speak the truth uh, that is now so, so jeopardized. Amen. This whole corrupt system is sustained by the status anxiety of horrible liberal parents. You're absolutely right. Exactly. Thank you. Heather McDonald, you've really done so much to tell the truth, and we appreciate it. Congrats on the book. Thank you. Thank you, Tucker. Well, the New York Times is horrified to discover that American companies might have to raise their wages for American workers rather than rely on low-paid immigrants from abroad to clean their toilets. Probably the most revealing New York Times story ever written, and we'll break it down for you after the break. We want to close tonight by highlighting a deeply revealing story that ran in the New York Times over this weekend. The piece highlights the suffering of one especially benighted and overlooked American. No, it wasn't an unemployed machinist in Toledo, whose family has been decimated by fentanyl. It's instead a man named Rob Hurst. He manages a hotel on Martha's Vineyard. That's an island where rich Democrats spend the summer. The story notes with horror that thanks to Trump... Hearst can't hire Jamaican seasonal workers to clean his bathrooms anymore, and sometimes, brace yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, he has to do it himself. In the view of the New York Times, this is what hell looks like. In fact, it's the whole reason for our immigration system, our mass immigration system, in the first place, so that people who look like you don't have to clean toilets. That's what the New York Times believes, and amazingly, now they're admitting it. They're no longer embarrassed. Thank heaven. 
That's it for us tonight. Tune in every night at 8 p.m. to the show that is the sworn, and we mean it, enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and especially groupthink. <laughs> Good night from Washington. Sean Hannity. 